through it, we're going to develop a small magnetic field around it. And uh, it's kind of irrelevant but for your test, but anyway, there's in the book it tells you about the, the left hand rule. If, if you take your left hand, point it direction of current flow, wrap your fingers, that tells you the direction of the actual magnetic, magnetic uh, field around the conductor. Now if we take, take that piece of wire now and we coil it up into a, into a coil, now with close together, now all that's gonna, that magnetic field is going to add up to with each other. Each bit of it's going to add up and so we're going to have a lot bigger magnetic field. So, so far we're still talking about uh, DC. So you're all probably realize or not you're familiar with this because a coil, magnetic coil like that is called you know, typically as a solenoid. Everybody uses one in their washing machine. You have an elect electromagnetic uh, relay which operates the valve, turns the water on and off. Uh, relays. They're all all a form of uh, of an inductor. Electromagnet. So I believe Tony probably reminded you last week, in the law of physics, energy is never created or destroyed. You can only change it from one form to another. So in an inductor, when we have a current flowing through it, we, have the, we build up this magnetic field. So we're actually storing a certain amount of energy as that magnetic field. And what happens when we turn the power off or that current stops, well that magnetic field that we've developed has to go somewhere so it actually induces it back into the wire in the opposite direction. So that's why the term inductance comes because it can induce that stored magnetic field or stored magnetic energy back into our, our wiring. And here's a couple of things that you should, if you're following me in the tech, but, but uh, I think there's some questions. I actually went through the question bank and uh, picked out some of the questions. So hopefully we have a little bit of time near the end tonight and we'll just review some of the actual questions. So one of the points that I did catch there was questions on is the, uh, based on the construction of a coil. It says, in other words, the more turns, the stronger the field, the length of the coil, you know, basically how many turns, whatever, uh, the diameter of the coil, all affect the inductance. And also the material, they talk about the permeability of the coil, which is another item there that we will talk about. If we Take our plain coil of wire, and now we insert a piece of metal in the core. So now we've actually put a put a metal core that that increases the inductions. It makes makes that magnetic field even stronger. And the big property of inductance is the fact that it opposes any change in the current flow. So an inductor, likes once you get a nice steady current flow, that's what it, it likes to keep it. So it, it opposes any change in the current flow. It likes to keep a nice, uh, nice steady uh, current. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And electronic symbol for inductance capital letter L 
and it's measured in And our basic measurement of conductors is, is in Henry. Quite, quite typically, you'll see uh, micro. It, they could be a small. It could be micro Henrys or milli Henrys. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the various prefixes? Did you cover that, or am I quickly over? Because yeah. typical prefixes like a milli would be one thousandth of a Henry. And a micro is one millionth okay. of a Henry. Okay. Or if you do it, want to do it in, yeah. in scientific notion, it's mm -hmm. 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 6. If, if that works better for you. So we'll talk briefly. Now that was was decent. Now if we apply uh, AC to that coil, well, what's happening? Remember, uh, remember uh, the difference between AC and DC. If we looked at a plot of uh, voltage over time, for DC, it's just a straight line, right? Voltage is constant over any period of time. Whereas in Whereas in AC, we again we look at the plot of voltage over time. This being one one cycle where it goes from the zero, fully positive, back to zero, fully negative, and back back to zero. Now when we apply AC to that coil, now all of a sudden we don't have a nice steady DC current anymore. So now our current and our voltage are constantly changing. So in this coil, so one half cycle, it's charging up, it's creating magnetic field in one direction. And all of a sudden we go to zero, it has to, the magnetic field has to collapse and then build up in the opposite polarity. And that's happening at our AC frequency. Typically we talk about the power line is 60 cycles per second. We're, we're changing. And we talk about uh, what the changing permeability of the coil. It's a fancy name for basically for varying it. So if we were to take this this core, and quite typically we'll make it a little, would be threaded piece of uh, typically uh, powdered iron or ferrite pressed into like a little screw, and by by screwing that that core in and out of our coil of wire, we actually change the properties and we change the inductance of it. And uh, the show on the chapter is a picture of just a symbol of a variable of a variable inductor and also the show an inductor with some uh, some very top, some tops that you can just top it at various points. Uh, That's what's this problem. Wait. What's up now? Oh. Okay. All right. Let's. Maybe this last bit.
Right. Okay, so let's see. And so we just uh, viewed a minute ago, we we're talking about our two various types of current or power, DC and EC. <coughs> Again, our DC is a uh, straight line that has displayed voltage control versus time. AC and our, our fundamentals when we have moving electrons or current flow through a conductor we create a magnetic field and the change in magnetic field causes the electrons to move so like we were talking about when we have that collapsing magnetic field it causes a current to move through our conductor our wire All right, and we mentioned inductors store energy in the form of a magnetic field, uh, electric field, and as I was just reiterating, the source of electrons move, the magnetic field collapses. Same 
as if resistors use the same formula. It's with an inverse tree. You guys take that one uh, last week with resistors with Tony? Alright. Now, magnetic field surrounding inductor can if in close proximity. So we have we have our R inductor, we have another coil close enough to it. So now that magnetic field, it's, it's constantly changing. It's building up, collapsing, changing polarity. So that field's always changing. Well, so that, that changing magnetic field can induce a current into another coil, which is close, which is in close proximity, or that basis of a transformer, which is basically a, an advanced form of an inductor. So next slide. A very very simple transformer. Here's our main inductor, what they call prim the primary winding, which then induces, which induces a current, likewise at a voltage, into the secondary winding. No, we're only talking AC, right? Transformers do not like DC; they do not work. So this is our very basic transformer. As you can see, with with a common magnetic core, it helps to transfer the magnetic magnetic field. Okay, next slide. Okay, so everything in transformer works in ratios. So if we take the number of turns in the secondary of the transformer compared to the number of turns in the primary of the transformer, we have the exact same ratio for the secondary voltage versus the primary voltage, sorry. And they call this the number of secondary turns over a number of primary turns to be the turns ratio. Just a quick example, like typically we would have Get a good static charge, 
touch ground and all of a sudden you get that, that surge? Well, there's a capacitor. You basically have isolated thing. So in building a capacitor, we have two conductive surface areas, which are typically metal plates in the simplest form. We have a space of some sort between the plates. And generally it could be air or paper or, or some chemical in, be in between them. But anyway, we store the charge in a capacitor in the form of an electrostatic field. Just like I said, static electricity. Okay, next. And very, very common capacitors you'll see in ceramics, some mica, and tantalum. Some of the very more, more common ones. So I put this a little bit in uh, electrolytics. They're a little bit special. We'll talk about them in a, in a minute. Okay, go on next. All right, capacitor. The basic unit of capacitance is the ferret. And also the symbol for our capacitor is, is C. Well, that one's easy. And again, typical capacitance ranges. Like a one farad is a very, very large capacitor. Typically in electronics or, or radio, you're basically always going to be dealing in, in fractions. So we'll come with micro being one millionth and a nano basically one billionth and a pico is a million uh, micros. It's it's small, but those are three three ranges that are very common. You'll see capacitors ranging. Okay, go over the next one. All right. Now, capacitors, they, I don't know, capacitors, they turn all our theories and all our problems in upside down. Because now, when we put capacitors in series, basically, <coughs> what we're doing is essentially, between our two terminal plates, we're actually effectively moving, the, moving our plates apart and, and the resulting fact is actually it's reduced. So we use the same formulas for parallel. Everything's reversed between inductors and capacitors. So now capacitors in series, you calculate them the same way as you do inductors in parallel. This is another another form of a calculation. I don't know if the he showed you that uh, when you did resistor theory last week. You can only do them like two at a time. So basically you uh, take the product over the sum and that, that will give you your parallel value. Or sorry, your series value. Okay, next. And when we put the positive in parallel, it's just as if we we added them, so it's just like we made those plates bigger. So just like we had more air surface area, so it effectively it's actually one big capacitor. So we just so the the resulting capacitance is just the sum of all the capacitors in parallel. All right, now when we talk about EC, now we're going to introduce some new terms. Because we said, like an inductor, the main thing of an inductor is it opposes change. It does not like change. So it actually, so when we apply a changing AC voltage to it, it, it develops another property which we call reactance. Reactance, the symbol for reactance is an X. So in this case, or subscript, so X, the subscript L means inductive reactants, and here's the formula for it. 2 pi, which is constant, so you know, the value of pi is 3.14 in, in uh, multiple uh, repeating digits, but just 3.14 is, is sufficient, times the frequency of the AC signal times the inductor, and that will calculate the reactants. I'll, show, I'll carry on more in a minute. Likewise, our capacitors have to be difficult. Everything is inverse. So, when we calculate our capacitive reactance, it's the inverse. So it's 
value of 1 over 2 pi times the frequency times the capacitance. And when we use these formulas, remember, we have to go back to our basic values. So when, when we calculate this, we have to have, our frequency has to be in hertz, and our, and our capacitance has to be in farads. Right, so like you can't just you just can't plug in megahertz and, and microfarads and expect it all to work out. You have to you have to count for the units so that everything is is related to the base values. Okay, next one. Okay. All right. If a circuit contains both resistance and reactance, the opposition to AC current is called impedance which is a fancy name for kind of the a combination, it's like our AC resistance. So we hear that term very commonly. When we have uh, speakers for our stereo rated, we talk about the impedance being 8 ohms, right? So that's the combination of the resistance of the wire and the actual reactance of the, of the inductor or the transformer that, that forms your speaker. And here's the formula. For a, for a simple series circuit, we'll just talk about that now, for example. Impedance, the value for impedance is a Z, and Z is equal to the square root, oh, I typed that wrong. It's R squared plus X squared, sorry about the mistake, but it's right in your book. Alright, thanks. Resonance, a very special condition, is when the inductive reactance is equal to the capacitive reactance. And the formula to calculate the resonant frequency of a circuit is 1 over the value of 2 pi times the square root of inductance times the capacitance. And that will calculate your resonant frequency. Here's something, and I believe there's questions in the test on this. In a series LC circuit, or inductive capacitive circuit, it has minimum impedance at resonance. So at the resonant frequency, and only the resonant frequency, the reactance of the capacitor is equal to the reactance of the inductor. Now, I'm not going to get into the, that, that because, but just take my word for it, it's because the two items are actually out of phase, they cancel each other out, and so you have the very minimum impedance at resonant. So, what will we use this for? If we were going to develop some sort of a filter in our radio, so what would happen? So at the resonant frequency, so if we want just a particular frequency to, to go through, so the very minimum impedance is going to be at the resonant frequency. So we're either designing the circuit, or one of these values, or both of them, can be tunable. So you can have a variable capacitor and or a variable inductor. And by adjusting them, we get them so that the resonant frequency of the circuit is the frequency that we want to pass. And that's something we use commonly in, in uh, radio fuel. Okay, next. Alright, likewise, the parallel resonant circuit has the very maximum impedance at the frequency of resonance. So if we wanted to block a particular frequency, so we have the actual maximum amount of impedance between these two points. So any signal basically up below or above resonance is going to see a lower impedance, so we're going to let through more of that signal and we're going to put the maximum amount of blocking on the frequency that we've tuned it resonance for. And when we talk about filters or tuned circuits, we talk a value of Q, which basically is how, if you look at the response or the bend, it's very good. If you have a high Q, it's going to be very very selective for a very uh, small frequency band. And with a lower Q, like, like what you see here, it's actually a wider, a wider frequency band. 
Okay. Okay. I guess I went through that a little faster than I planned to, but okay. Any questions so far? We talked about inductors, special form of the inductors, which is transformers. We talked about capacitors. Remember that the uh, energy in an inductor is stored in a form of a magnetic field. The energy stored in a capacitor is, for, is stored in the form of electrostatic field. Okay, if I could just add a Go point ahead. here, and that is that um, on the test, you're not going to be asked to do square root. Okay, that's not going to be part of it. Um, and you're not going to be asked to um, calculate a resonance frequency or to calculate uh, um, reactants or um, uh, the uh, um, impedance of a, of a circuit. That's not going to be uh, included. You are going to be asked to uh, calculate uh, capacitors in series and in parallel, uh, inductors in series and in parallel. But uh, all those uh, uh, formulas with square roots in them, don't worry about them, they're not on the test. <coughs> will, um, will, it, will there be a formula sheet, or formulas will be need to... Uh... Unfortunately, no, there's no formula sheet, so uh, you have to memorize the formulas, but they're pretty well straightforward, and they follow like one so from the other. You know, they're, they're pretty well a, a series of of ideas that sort of fit together, right? Cool. Yeah, and the numbers on the test, the numbers that they use, they don't use uh, fancy numbers like 3.1256, you know? It's not going to be there. They're going to give you a 20 volts, 1 amp, you know, it's all going to be simple arithmetic. And it's basically dividing, multiplying, subtracting. That's all that it is on the test. No square roots, no heavy mathematics, honestly. You will see it when you get into the practice exams, okay, on the, uh, on the internet. And there's others here that have, have taken the course and they'll, they'll tell you that's the yeah, I think they've actually made it simpler, because I think it used to have to, yeah, used to, have to calculate a few things. Right? You used to have to calculate resonant frequency, but not anymore. Because actually, when I went through the test, it did make it easy for you to come. 
cases where they did say, if you have two equal value inductors in parallel, what what is the resulting value? Half. Okay? I just saved you a bit of math. Alright. Let me think. Okay, we've gone through very quickly. Let's see if I missed anything. We'll get ready to take a coffee in a few minutes and then but uh, after coffee, any questions? Or maybe we'll do is I'll uh, we'll just review some of the uh, questions from the question bank. Actually, this has gone a lot faster than I hope. <laughs> Fortunately, thanks for the help, and I'm glad the uh, the PowerPoint got working because it just saved saved drawing a lot of things manually. And like in the book, there's there's some examples of. Calculate some calculated vectors in parallel, which is natural values. We'll talk. Like I say, and some examples of transformers. Remember, like I said, transformers always remember it's everything's in ratios. Basically, we typically talk about the voltage ratio as of the primary voltage to the secondary voltage. But just always remember that Tom enemy. Power in is power out. So if our secondary current is say one tenth of the primary voltage, that's fine. But also now remember because the power out, so now our output current is going to be ten times the in input current. So it's like a like reciprocal. Okay, we'll talk just yeah, transformers. Transformers have three major applications in AC circuits. One is isolating one part of a circuit from the other when you don't want them to be directly connected. We can, we can use a transformer to, to isolate them. We can raise or lower voltages and we can match impedance. Which in some cases uh, we all see, like for example, we're talking going back to our loudspeaker theory. In other words, we have to match the impedance of the amplifier to the, to the impedance of the speaker. So if we have a fairly uh, a solid state amplifier with a fairly high impedance, we need to match it for the low impedance of the speaker. We we'll use base get transform because in in theory. The maximum power transfer occurs when the input impedance matches the output impedance. That's when the maximum amount of power gets transferred. And in the in the book too, there's some, some, uh, some diagrams. Sorry, I didn't have any uh, props with me. My, I'm in the process of reorganizing my shop. Everything's in boxes right now. But like uh, typical, we'll talk about an air air dielectric capacitor. It's a uh, capacitor with a set of well, plates which rotate. So that by the amount of plates which are meshed at any point in time, you actually vary the uh, capacitance of the very common in, in all the radios for the actual tuning capacitor when they actually when your tuning knob actually was a capacitor and what it was it would move a set of plates in and out. And again factors affecting capacitance, the effective area of the plates, the distance between the plates the uh, material between the plates, whether they're just simply air or whatever it's called, dielectric is what is between the plates. We talked about capacitors in series and parallel. We talked about reactants. We talked about impedance. <coughs> we talked about resonance. We've used a lot of uh, a lot of topics so far, but. Uh, well, but if we take our break and then we'll come back and uh, see if anybody has any questions. Just before we do that, um, I didn't get a chance to uh, to introduce uh, Dave. So um, as we're starting off with technical problems, but I want to tell you that, um, that Dave is a senior electronics uh, man. He's worked in the plant for a number of years, and he 
is our specialist when it comes to the repeaters. We have um, two repeaters that belong to the club. There's, there's probably five or six repeaters in town. There are two that belong to the club. Um, uh, the E3 uh, SSM is the uh, 14694 repeater. And uh, uh, Dave, of course, uh, set that up and got it working. Now also, um, he maintains it on a regular basis for us, and we're very happy that he, he has the time to do that, especially now that he's retired. He can, he can spend more time on these projects that we have for him. Um, the other thing is the, um, the world has gone digital, and they've gone to digital repeaters now. And so uh, the club was passing around for a long time, thinking about what are we going to do? D-Star is in. D-Star by ICOM is in. Uh, that's one form of repeater. There's Fusion by Yesu. Uh, the commercial people have DMR and all that sort of thing. So uh, eventually we bit the bullet in the uh, Elbow Amateur Radio Club and a bunch of the boys, including myself, ponied up to buy a repeater. We bought a ICOM stack. Uh, we have 146 uh, 210, is it? 145 210. 145 210, which is a digital ICOM repeater. And uh, it was a perfect storm because they lowered the prices on the handhelds right at Radio World just at the right time. And 17 of those radios were sold. And some guys in the, in the club bought the mobile, the base station, and the handhelds. So they went like hotcakes. Dave, what do you got? You've got a handheld and mobile. And a mobile. And uh, basically, you know, I'm using a mobile. The two, right two, uh, two handhelds? No, just one. So we sold a lot of these radios. Now, these, this is the way electronics is, and radio is going. It's going to digital mode now. So you have to have a chip in there called a vocoder, right? And what it does is it takes your voice and it turns it from analog because your voice is analog, right? It's going up and down like this in air. It takes that and it digitizes it to okay and it sends it and then it's put back into analog at the other end so that you can hear. This is the way the world is going and we have this repeater in town and Dave was the one who installed it and set it up and believe me I read the instructions on how to do it and I said Thank God Dave is doing it because I'm not even going to touch it. It needed Linux. You needed to know how to in do Linux files on the computer to be able to run it. Now what it does, digital, right, what it does is it uses the internet as a gateway. When, the, when you stick around you're going to find out more about this. So the signal actually goes through the internet and then pops out anywhere. Now the first night you were shown IRLP. This is similar goes to the internet on that little dinky handheld, but right? it'll be just like that. That'll work on IRLP. This one will go digital all around the world, just clicking a little button, okay? You can talk on things called reflectors. And it, that is, this is just fantastic. And the club puts these this on. We've switched to reflectors at certain times. So you, uh, well, for instance, I was getting the internet, was it last night or the night before? I was getting international um, worldwide uh, D-Star net and they were from all Australia, New Zealand, everybody was on there together. So having said this about that, there's only one dozen donuts there. There was only 11 guys here last time so I figured hey I'm only gonna buy a dozen donuts. Now all you guys show up and they got I don't know you're gonna fight over the donuts. Please don't fight over yeah, the donuts. <laughs> okay it's break time. <laughs> all right let's have, let's have a break.
I had to clean it up later. Yeah, I mean, they have the same name.